Let's start at the beginning with a look at the definitions of racism. Notions that dominate the media, education and politics are of overt far-right groups and individuals. They're rare and characterized by extreme hatred, intent, attitude and sometimes violence. Hence, most people see racism through this lens. But there's more to it than this. The role of power and wider society. Including these factors delivers clarity, depth, consistency and insight. As we've already seen in part one, attitude without power is relatively benign. And I'll continue to demonstrate this throughout this film. So let's have a look at some key terms and definitions. We'll begin with the dictionaries and the poor example. OxfordDictionaries.com Apparently this is OED online and comes with the strap line, the world's most trusted dictionaries. Racism. The belief that all members of each race possess characteristics, abilities or qualities specific to that race, especially so as to distinguish it as inferior or superior to another race or races. So what's wrong with this? Well, it's just ideology. Collins English Dictionary, Wikipedia, Britannica, etc. all follow suit. There's no mention of the role of power and the role of wider society. We can do better than this. I've emphasized important text with a yellow highlight for your attention. This is from the American Heritage New Dictionary of Cultural Literacy, 3rd edition. Racism. The belief that some races are inherently superior, physically, intellectually or culturally, to others and therefore have a right to dominate them. In the United States, racism, particularly by whites against blacks, has created profound racial tension and conflict in virtually all aspects of American society. Until the breakthroughs achieved by the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, white domination over blacks was institutionalized and supported in all branches and levels of government by denying blacks their civil rights and opportunities to participate in political, economic and social communities. This is a better definition because it invokes the role of power, the establishment, and social structures. This is another example of a better definition of racism. It comes from dictionary.com. The first part covers the ideology. We know about this already, so we'll go straight to the second part. Racism, a policy, system of government, etc., based upon or fostering such a doctrine, discrimination. It's a better definition because it also points to the role of power. Remember the section that covered the stats for wealth? poverty, health, mental health, education, and also criminal justice. This is why it matters that the definition covers power, institutions, social structures, the establishment. It's time to move on to the good definitions now. So how do the experts and specialists on racism go about defining it? Next up is an extract from Liberation Theory by Erica Marcuse. Racism is a shorthand way of categorizing the systematic mistreatment experienced by people of color and third world people. This systematic mistreatment is a result of institutionalized inequalities in the social structure. Racism is one consequence of a self-perpetuating imbalance in economic, political and social power. This imbalance consistently favors members of some ethnic and cultural groups at the expense of others. The consequences of this imbalance pervade all aspects of the social system and affect all facets of people's lives. Racism helps to perpetuate a social system in which some people are consistently haves and others consistently have nots. Next up, Ron Daniels, politician and activist. Again, key words are highlighted in yellow. Theories of race and attitudes of racial superiority and inferiority evolved into an institutionalized system of discrimination and oppression based on color or race. In the black community, very often we call this a system of white supremacy. Racism is a system of special privileges, benefits and rewards for white people. Next up, we'll be drawing from the words of Tim Wise. Again, I've highlighted key text. As with other isms, like capitalism, communism, etc., racism is both an ideology and a system. As a system, racism is an institutional arrangement maintained by policies, practices and procedures, both formal and informal, in which some persons typically have more or less opportunity than others, and in which such persons receive better or worse treatment than others, because of their respective racial identities. 
Additionally, institutional racism involves denying persons opportunities, rewards or various benefits on the basis of race, to which those individuals are otherwise entitled. In short, racism is a system of inequality based on race. You may have been surprised to have heard the words white supremacy. White supremacy has become a common term in mature discussions on racism involving all races over the last few decades. It's important to comprehend what we mean by white supremacy, so let's have a closer look at it. This is Frances Lee Ansley, a distinguished professor of law, and this is what she means when she uses the words white supremacy. By white supremacy, I do not mean to allude only to the self-conscious racism of white supremacist hate groups. I refer instead to a political, economic and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions and social settings. And this is how Tim Wise puts it. White supremacy is the operationalized form of racism in the United States and throughout the Western world. Racism is like the generic product name, while white supremacy is the leading brand, with far and away the greatest market share. Next up are two quotes on white supremacy by Neely Fuller Jr. If you do not understand white supremacy as racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. And the only form of functional racism that exists among the people of the known universe is white supremacy. Critical race theory, CRT, also uses the term white supremacy. As an evolving approach, CRT is not precisely defined. Professor David Gilborn and Dr. Nicola Rollock give the following description of CRT. CRT is a body of scholarship that seeks to explore and challenge the prevalence of racial inequality in society. It's based on the understanding that race and racism are the product of social thought and power relationships. CRT theorists endeavour to expose the way in which racial inequality is maintained through the operation of structures and assumptions that appear normal and unremarkable. CRT has its origins in the USA and is now a major branch of social theory. Much of the world has embraced it. The UK has done so in the last decade. CRT is attractive partly for its solution-focused approach, i.e. the dominant group has a crucial role to play. Firstly, as listeners. Hence, David Gilborn says, white people do not know everything. Indeed, in a society structured by racist oppression, there are certain things white people cannot know. From this position of listener, learning and action can follow. Again, David Gilborn, because genuine anti-racism is about power, it requires that the majority change their actions. This is essential because the majority, white people, get privileges from racism. This is known as white privilege, and we need to comprehend this term if we're to comprehend racism. White privilege is a gentle way of looking at racism. It's the flip side. Tim Wise puts it like this. It's common sense. If there's underprivileged, then there must be overprivileged. White privilege refers to any advantage, opportunity, benefit, head start, or general protection from mistreatment, which white people will typically enjoy, but others won't. Some examples then. Let's begin with material benefits. These will look somewhat familiar. White people have greater net worth, including assets. Historically, white people have had the better opportunity to accumulate wealth and pass it on to the following generations. And white people have greater opportunity in the labour market. There's also social benefits with presumptions of competence, creditworthiness, law abidingness and intelligence. Psychological benefits include not having to worry about triggering negative stereotypes, rarely having to feel out of place or unwelcome, and not having to worry about racial profiling. The fact that white privilege exists does not mean that all whites are wealthy or always win in competition for jobs and other opportunities. It's a general advantage that need not be requested or even agreed to. Sometimes other factors come into play, male privilege for example. On balance though, it pays to be a member of the dominant group, white. Peggy McIntosh gives tens of examples of white privilege. A paraphrased selection follows. Nothing that I say or do will be taken as representing my race, 
or being down to my race. Not my body shape, odour, eating habits, manners, politics, expressions, dress, punctuality or tardiness. Hobbies, interests, skills, talents, abilities, weaknesses, strengths, successes or failures. There's more. I can be sure that my children will get curricular material testifying to the existence of their race and its contributions. I can be sure of having my voice heard in the group where I'm the only member of my race. I can go to most meetings, social, institutional, etc., feeling welcomed and belonging, rather than isolated, out of place, outnumbered, unheard, held at a distance or feared. I can imagine many options, social, political, creative or professional, without asking if my race would make it difficult or impossible. I can arrange my activities to always avoid experiencing feelings of rejection due to my race. I can easily find academic courses and institutions which give attention only to people of my race. I can travel alone or with my spouse without expecting embarrassment or hostility in those who are dealing with this. And I do not have to educate my children on systematic racism for their daily protection. Here's a few examples from my own experiences. They all apply in the context of discussing and explaining racism in informal settings. If I had white privilege in those situations, then I'd be heard without invalidation by the following. Being labelled aggressive when intense or assertive is the reality. Getting told I'm being overly simplistic when I have clarity and insight. Being called smug when I'm confident. Being labelled a know-it-all when I'm well informed. Being called a smartass when I know my stuff and express it well under challenges. Being told I'm overthinking when I'm comprehensive. Having my experience, expertise, specialism or intelligence disrespected. Being treated as insubordinate when I stand my ground and getting dismissed as wholly, permanently wrong for making a single mistake or factual inaccuracy no matter how trivial or irrelevant.